Welcome to the Man Up God's Way podcast, a show that dives into the real, raw, and relevant issues for men in their faith, life, and community. Now, your host, Jody Birkin. Well, welcome to Man Up God's Way podcast. My name is Jody Burkeen, and I am the founder and your host today. And this is a special episode. I'm really excited uh, to have my guest on here today. Um, One of the things that we need to do as Christians and uh, followers of Jesus, we need to make sure that we support not only Christian ministries, but Christian media as well and um, uh, today my guest is an actress and she has been in Hollywood is in Nashville now and we're going to talk about uh, many of the stuff that she's been in Uh, but she has a new movie coming out uh, with the skit guys and it is called family camp and today my guest is Lee Allen Baker Lee Allen how are you doing today it's a beautiful day in Tennessee so I'm doing great (laughs) <laughs> outstanding you. outstanding well thank you so much for joining me today um uh you and i have known each other uh we haven't been in contact for almost 40 40 plus years but yeah. uh, we have known each other we grew up in the same small town in murray kentucky and uh it is uh you and your brother and i are, have been best friends since high school and uh, we still stay in contact and see each other and text uh and call each other just about weekly. And I always check up on you. I've always checked in, see how you were doing and followed you on social media. And uh, I had to watch you for um, a long, long time because my daughter uh, loved uh, Good Luck Charlie. And so we felt like we knew you. Every time the show would come on, I was like, I know her, I know her brother, I know her family. And uh, it was really cute. So um, again, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, it's my pleasure. My pleasure. So, so tell me, um, so you and I grew up in Murray. Um, yeah. When did you, you and I were, I think we're four years apart. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. That was a yep. senior, you were in eighth grade, mm-hmm. um, I think. Yeah, because you were in my brother's uh, grade. Yeah. Oh, wait, so, wait. Are you, in, are you in Chuck's class? Yes. Yeah. So I'm, I'm a year older than your brother. So when okay. you were a senior, so you were, I was a freshman. You were a freshman. Okay. I was thinking you were in the same grade as John. Okay. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So you were a freshman. All right. Mm-hmm. Uh, I couldn't remember if we went to high school together or not. Uh, you know how seniors are when, yes. you know, the, all the younger classmen. But uh, uh, so tell us, tell us how you got from um, Little Murray, Kentucky to Hollywood and, and now to Nashville. So share your story with us. Well, I grew up always knowing what I wanted to do for a living. It was something that God had always placed on my heart. It literally was something that I just knew. I I couldn't believe it when other people would say, I'm not sure what I want to do. I don't really know. I mean, I just knew. Um, And so I just followed that and trusted it. And I, I really never looked back. So I always knew that when I turned 18, I would leave. And my mom even found a piece of paper where I had listed the universities I wanted to go to. And I had USC as number one out in Southern California. And that's where I ended up going. And I studied theater and Shakespeare and film there. And then I really just kind of, God opened so many doors for me. I started working almost right away. My first pilot season two audition, I, I booked a pilot and it got picked up and it aired and um, it was called uh, The Last Frontier, it was on Fox. And then from then on, it went from, I thought, this is so easy, right? Wow. (laughs) Everybody says that doing a pilot is like catching lightning in a bottle. And like, I just showed up and this is how you do it, right? That was like my thing song. This is how you do it. And then cut to, it was years later before I got Good Luck Charlie. I mean, I had Mm. recurring roles on Will and Grace. I had recurring roles on Charmed. I had recurring roles on a show called In Case of Emergency. I had guest starred on all these shows. I had done lots of pilots, but I just couldn't seem to get on one that got picked up. It was just tough. Um, I was on all the lists, which I'm not on anymore. (laughs) Right. That in a minute. (laughs) I I marched myself right (laughs) off that list. Um, (laughs) So uh, then I finally, when I decided I'd, I'd been doing a show for HBO, they had put $30 million into this show. And um, 
it was with uh, Mary Kay Place, Lily Tomlin, Gary Cole. I mean, it was a really great lineup of heavy hitters. And it was just this incredible show called 12 Miles of Bad Road. And it was about the richest right. stretch of land in Dallas, Texas. And it was advertised on HBO. We made six episodes. Uh, it was advertised as being the next best, the thing, best thing is yet to come after The Sopranos. So it was, this was my moment. This was it. And this was the part of a lifetime. And then one day, the head of HBO, Chris Albrecht, slapped his girlfriend and it was caught on video. And the board got together, fired Chris Albrecht, and got rid of all the shows that he had his hand in. And that was my cow. Yeah. So then the next thing you know, I decided, you know what? I I had this attitude if HBO is going to cancel me, I'm going to cancel them. So I canceled my little. (laughs) Personal subscription to HBO. (laughs) And then I decided, what am I doing? I've got this great husband and all I do is sit around wondering when the next best thing is going to happen for me. So I just really had wanted to be a mom my whole life. And I kept putting it off for this pilot or that pilot to see if this got picked up or that got picked up. So I got pregnant right away. And then I got an audition when I was nine months pregnant for this show called Good Luck Charlie, a show about a mom who goes back to work after having a baby. Okay. And I was like, okay, so I did it. I auditioned and, and I didn't hear from them, didn't hear from them, didn't hear from them. And I was like, that's stupid. I know I have this part. I know this is mine. Right. And um, then I find out they cast someone else. And I thought, I don't buy it. I just don't get it. I don't buy it. So I'm walking with my baby, who at the time is now like four months old, and the phone rings. And mm, good luck, Charlie's calling. Oh, right, they are. You know. So what happened was I just didn't go into labor in time for them to fill the film the pilot. So oh no uh, kidding. Yeah, because I just kept staying pregnant and pregnant and pregnant for the longest time. They, <laughs> I get pregnant very easily, but they have to cut those babies out of me because I just, just carry them forever. And uh, so then I started doing Good Luck Charlie when my youngest was, I think, about six months old. And so I really became a mom to two families at once. So it was just this huge blessing. And I kind of at first was like, what am I doing? Like, I've just come off this huge HBO series. And I mean, let's be honest, Disney is where adults' careers go to die. And here I am. Um, And it was just the most fun show and the best experience with the best people and the kindest people. And I loved working with those kids. And it really changed my perspective on who I want to work with, honestly. Oh, that's great. That's great. Now, when you're you're doing this kind of stuff, do you actually have a choice of people that you, like, when you get a script, for an example, do you just look at it and go, okay, this is, this is up my alley, or this is not something I would even consider, or does your yeah. agent already know that kind of stuff? I mean, have you all kind of figured that kind of stuff out? Because you do. My man most knows me pretty well, okay. um, but he's still surprised at things that I'll be like, nope, ain't doing it, you know? Okay. Um, so I'm kind of one of these people that's uncompromisable. I've always been very right. stubborn. Um, and I'm just not willing to like to, money's just not that important to me, honestly. It's right. really not to, for me to sell my soul out, you know. So I after Good Luck Charlie, there were a lot of offers for very sexy roles and lustful, you know. I hate to use the word like lustful the shows that like that's, had me. That's true. It was, like, I mean, that's... it was like porn. It was like porn. Right. And I was like, ah. Right. Because everybody thought it would be really fun to see the Disney mom do porn, right? I guess. Right, exactly. But these were like high profile shows on on stars or Cinemax or and I was like, I'm not I'm not doing that, you know? Right. Um so and and also at that point, you know, things kind of came to a crashing halt because even though Good Luck Charlie was the number one show in the world, I had spoken out and mentioned that um, I was not a fan of vaccinations because my children were injured and then I didn't get any auditions anymore. And from that moment on, I was not on any more lists to come in to audition for things. No kidding. Yeah. No, so did that, did that, ha- did that, did that kind of go to um, the, the, I wouldn't call it a cancellation, but just the ending of Good Luck Charlie or was that, um, no, it, was it kind just of, kind of time out anyway? No, uh, 
so good luck charlie just expired it it hit okay. it wasn't canceled disney shows don't go more than four years it's kind of special if they do go that extra fourth year but what happens after that is that they have to pay the crew this is how cheap it is they have to pay the crew actual standard wages and they don't want to do that oh. and so that's why if a show is revamped it's changed and the name is changed and they wow. revamp it and you you couldn't really revamp a show about a family I mean, I guess right, you, yeah. you could have taken maybe the young boy off into his own world or the college kid, but it was really a unique show for Disney Channel and the fact that it was an ensemble sitcom for the whole family. It wasn't geared just for kids. It was right. geared for adults and grandparents and people of all ages to watch it. So that was a surpri that was surprising to them that the show was such a success, given that it was kind of a very different demographic for them. And they actually, I believe, really did try to make a fifth season out of that and give it a go. But the truth of the matter is on those shows, when you think about it from their business perspective, and I understand this, is that kids, um, Good Luck Charlie was unique and that kids of all ages could continue to watch it. But right. most kids will watch their show for a certain extended period of time. Then they've grown up and they don't want to see that show anymore. They've moved right. on to more adult things. And so they could just rerun it and it cost them nothing to rerun it. True. And now right. a whole new generation will hop on board. So you can see the business model and why it works. Great for them. Wasn't good for me, but. You know. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. My daughter had watched that show religiously and it, there was a you know certain point in time for our kids that we only allowed certain things to be able to, for them to watch. And that was one of them because it was very wholesome. Uh, there wasn't, um, you know, it didn't seem like there was a lot of political, politicization on um you know top uh, issues of the moment social issues yeah. and social media wasn't really that big of a um a, a, i wouldn't say it wasn't a big deal but it definitely wasn't what was uh, run in the country at the time when you were doing that show and so it was really nice to have a show uh for the kids um yeah. so being being as stubborn as you said you were does that that obviously sets you apart, especially in Hollywood, uh, from majority of the people. I mean, most of those people are there to sell their souls, uh, to, you know, to cash out, be famous, and uh, do whatever it takes to get in the movies. So did that set you apart quite a bit, even with Disney and everybody else? Yeah, I mean, I do, I do think it did. Um, you know, I guess I really changed when I had children. Like, I really changed. Mm -hmm. um, I just just saw the miracles of God and just I just loved my baby so much and mm, couldn't believe awesome. I was so blessed to live this life. I mean, really think about it. In one year, I mean, I had been struggling after getting a series. And now all of a sudden in one year, I get a series, two families at once. You know, I, my life just mm -hmm. really I knew to not take that for granted. I knew right. this is a real sweet spot I'm in right now. You know, mm, this is good. all the stars aligned and I was just showered with blessing upon blessing upon blessing. That's great. That is great. Ch kids will change you. Um, that's I was an atheist prior to having my children. And it was like seeing the seeing my children just I had them in my arms and I'm holding them. I'm looking at them. They were 18 months apart. And so, you know, I was able to hold them both, you know, at, at the same time, take them out of the crib late at night, and just hold them. And I remember looking at them one time and here I believe that we came from a cesspool of algae that, you know, we, you know, went from algae to a, a fish to a snake to a monkey to, you know, <laughs> and I just believed all this stuff. And uh, it wasn't until I was looking into my daughter's eyes that I realized in my son's eyes and I thought these, my kids didn't come out of a cesspool of algae, they were created. And That's right. It opened the, the door to my heart for God just to start walking in and, and working in that. So kids will definitely change you. Mm -hmm, they will. Um, and especially, especially when you think of leaving a legacy, you know, in, in the movies, uh, you know, and being an actress, the, the stuff that you do will never go away. You know, the yeah. movies that you make, the, um, the, the, the TV shows that you make, they will never go away. They will always be there for a legacy, a good or bad legacy for yes. your children. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, and you're leaving a good legacy for your children. And I honestly will tell you before I had children, it's, I'm no saint before I had children. It's not like I thought about that. Right. I mean, if it was a role and I wasn't embarrassed to do it. Right. Like I, right, I also yeah. am a person like, I don't want to be embarrassed doing something. 
So yeah. I won't compromise in that way, but I just, it wouldn't really dawn on me. Um, and now I really think, would I want my kid to see this? Would I, would they, I want them to be proud right. of their mother on this or embarrassed of their mother for this. And, um, you know, I'm, I, I'm not approved by any stretch of the imagination by any means, but I just really do weigh heavily what it is that I'm doing and if it's worth my time and effort. That's great. That's great. So your, your children, uh, during, um, uh, good luck, Charlie, you had your first child. And then uh, as a matter of fact, they actually wrote in, in good luck, Charlie, because of your second pregnancy, correct? They had that's you... actually, people think that, but that's actually not true. Okay. All right. So let me explain how this happened. So when we went away to do good luck, Charlie, it's Christmas, the movie one season, Okay. we went to Utah to film the movie and my youngest was two, I think at the time, maybe two and a half, not really sure, maybe three. It was around three. So in that movie, we find out that Amy Duncan is going to have a baby. And we were all so mad. We were like, that is ridiculous. Mm. Like the last thing this family needs is another baby. Can we please get a dog or something? <laughs> like this is crazy. Um, but they, and Disney insisted, no, we want to grow the show. So we want a baby on board. And I was like, oh my word. And then I got to thinking and thought, well, gosh, I want another baby. So if, if they want me to have a baby, I want a baby, maybe I'll work a baby into there this. Because the way I'm thinking <laughs> of it is, so if I get pregnant, then by the time we end se this season, surely they'll have the season finale be that I had the baby. Right. And then I will go on my maternity leave and it will have been, they will have been able to film my whole pregnancy and it'll be fantastic, right? So wow. I go to work on the first day back for that season. And they come out and they put a big pregnancy belly on me. And I, here I am like eight weeks pregnant. And I'm like, what's that? <laughs> and they said, well, we're going to start you off at six weeks pregnant. And I was like, oh, that's oh. a problem. <laughs> so <laughs> what they ended up doing is we would, as my belly would grow, we would kind of carve out the pregnancy belly on the show. And then when I did the episode where I actually had Toby, um, that's when I told the cast I was pregnant. They knew something was up because oh, wow. I was eating carbohydrates and I never do. <laughs> right. So, um, they knew something was up. But that's when I told them all that I was pregnant. And so for the rest of that whole season, which was a long season, I would have to um, hold laundry up, fold laundry, have a computer in front of me, be reading a magazine, something sitting behind a table would always, Just, something would always have to be behind my belly because my belly. Right, right. Oh, that's great. Well, it's crazy how they uh, work things in like that. So yes, yeah, that is good. So after good luck, Charlie, um, what what happened then? So where were you movie so wise, after, TV show wise? After good luck, Charlie, as I was still in really good standing with Disney Channel. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I, I know people are very down on Disney these days. I'm not comfortable with a lot of the propaganda that's being pushed either. But um, they were a great company to work for Disney Channel was. And, right. um, you know, there are really good, kind people that work there and they were very loyal to me. So as soon as Good Luck Charlie ended, I did a movie called Bad Hair Day that I executive produced. I helped to uh, write the dialogue. I helped to edit it every morning at 5 a.m. Um, oh, wow. And helped design the clothes, the hair, all of the things that an executive producer has their fingers in. Um, so it was a really great experience. I did that movie for them. Okay. And then after that, I did lots of um, animated shows for them and uh, was just going along quite well with now with two babies at this point. And, um, and then I did make one post about vaccines not being, I think it was on Hillary Clinton's uh, Twitter chain where she said, grandma knows vaccines are safe. Grandma knows best. And I just couldn't really hold my tongue anymore after that, because once a mother watches their child come home after right. vaccinations and scream for three hours with encephalitis and swelling of the brain and then go into seizures, then you realize they're not always safe and effective. Right. So you had a personal experience with uh, your children getting vaccinated and mm. uh, there are obviously um, known issues that come from, you know, uh, infant vaccines and toddler vaccines and, you know, just the stuff that they inoculate them with through, uh, through that. And so you had a personal experience with that. Was that your first or second son? Both of my children. My first right. son, I spread them out with because I was, uh -huh. I just, 
I guess my, my hesitation was, why do all of these moms say their kids were normal and then are autistic? And then all these moms had the same story and big pharma just says, oh no, that's not true. It's just a coincidence. Like, I just don't right. buy it. So I had said to my doctor, you know, does this, do these vaccines have thimerosal in them? Do they have mercury in them? And they had said, all heavy metals have been removed, all of them. Well, that's a lie. So it's, they've oh, changed wow. the adjuvunct, which is, it needs to be something so poisonous that your body rushes to it. Otherwise you'll get the illness. So that adjuvunct is what's causing a lot of damage. So it went from mercury to aluminum. They just switched the adjuvunct, but also they still have mercury in them. They just passed some laws behind the scenes where they don't have to tell you unless it has a certain amount in it. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So yeah. both of mine were injured. One of them more immediate than the other. The other one was just like, every time he would be vaccinated, we'd have to go back to the doctor within the next two days with stuff like, you know, racing heart and have to go see a heart specialist or right. um, swollen lymph nodes and glands sticking two inches out of the back of his head that we'd have to go to the emergency room for like pretty wow. severe um, instances where we would end up. And then it was, you know, walking on tiptoes, falling over, couldn't stand up. Right. You know, when, a, when a child is oh, totally yeah. normal one day and then is three years old, has a vaccine and now is bumping into walls and falling over. Like, you know, that there is a problem with that. Right. right? Exactly. Yeah, totally. So, yeah. So uh, how are they now? Have you, are you, is it a continual issue? Um, so are they pretty much better? after, pretty much after good luck, Charlie, my focus changed to healing my kids, as you can imagine. Okay. Uh, and okay, there, yeah. there's nothing that a person can do legally for this. I mean, I filed um, paperwork uh, with the VAERS, but they, they, they don't care. It's like, yeah. <laughs> you basically sign away saying there's nothing anybody can do. And so I could spend my money trying to pursue this and uh, get vind vindication. I don't know, because you don't, uh, the, yeah. most, the most you can get in a VAERS court of law is if you prove without a shadow of a doubt that that is 100% what killed your baby, if your baby dies, the most you can get is $250,000. So parents don't waste their time wow. going down that rabbit hole. Instead, they spend all of their money trying to cure and heal and better the lives of their children who have been affected uh, right. because you know it is expensive and your insurance isn't gonna cover any of those. It really doesn't. Right, yeah, that. exactly, yeah, no, you it know? doesn't. So um, wow. the, I kind of set on the path of natural medicine, holistic medicine, homeopathy, occupational therapy, behavioral therapies, um, to really detoxification, to really kind of cleanse them and help them. And yesterday was my son's last day of seventh grade. He's so beautiful. He's so sweet. He's so oh, kind. Awesome. He's doing so well. Um, he has some physical limitations that almost resemble a mild cerebral palsy. Um, okay. um, there's like toe walking. People think toe walking is just a gait that somebody adopts, but right. it's, it's actually a neurological condition where there's been brain damage that affects the balance and coordination in the body. Okay. And so what happens is in order for the body to be in go and be balanced as much as it can, it gets up on its toes and that gives okay. your body the symbol right. to kind of engage all of your muscles. So a lot of people don't, you know, when they comment or they're rude to me or they roll their eyes, they just don't understand the physical dynamics of a neurological injury. Right. Um, and then my other son, other than very low muscle tone, he has hypotonia and therefore very uh, poor speech. Um, mm -hmm. Other than that, um, they're really thriving and, and doing quite well. Oh, praise God. It's crazy to me. Like, you know, when we were growing up, we, we never saw anybody with allergies. We never saw anybody with autism. Um, we never, you know, like ADD wasn't even a thing or ADHD, I think what they call it now, wasn't even a thing. Maybe, you know, that probably could have been diagnosed with more people when we were growing up, but no peanut allergies, no gluten allergies, none of this kind of stuff. And so you've How got many to start people in our school did you see wandering around with a puffer, with asthma? Yeah, exactly. You didn't. Yeah, no asthma, nothing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so there's got to be something of either the you know with the vaccines or just the food or there, there's so much out there right now that is just causing you know gen well it's genetic or just uh, physical ailments that are on these kids that just, you know they do gosh, talk a lot about you know doctors will say to me you know perhaps it's something genetic in your family it's a medical history in your family um i had one when i was just had just given birth to kind of keep them off my baby. I let them give me one. I had a pretty severe reaction to it as well. So it could be something genetic, 
But I'll be honest, when I finally sat down as a mother and I had asked for information on the safety and efficacy of them from my doctor at the time after I, my child had the severe reaction, the encephalitis was the big one with the seizures. Um, I sat down and she sent me articles on how fortunate we are in the United States to have vaccines. <laughs> I was like, that's right. not a scientific <laughs> article proving to me that they're safe and effective. That's you telling me what your opinion is. So right. what I did was I found the ingredients in every vaccine that they had been given and the amount that they had been given at the age that they had been given oh, it. Wow. And then I went into my little computer and I started doing research, not on vaccines, because you're not going to find it. You're, you're right. not going to find a true studies on vaccination. You're going to find, um, you know, people's opinions. You're going to find yeah. they're good for you. You're going to find a lot of propaganda on both sides. You honestly, really. Yeah. You're not going to find a lot of science and so but if you start looking up every single individual ingredient then you, you can will, find yeah you will find some really interesting answers and what i had found was that um what both of my children had experienced uh matched identical to a study that had been done with um aluminum induced encephalitis and giving aluminum to rats Whoa. uh they couldn't they began to get hypotonia they could no longer hold on to the wire. Their hands were too weak and shaky and they would fall. My son has a very hard time holding a pencil and writing. It's very difficult for both of my boys. Um, you started to see the pattern of how dangerous this is. And it's so yeah. interesting to me that, what's interesting to me is that the public didn't go, oh my gosh, let's learn. Why did her kids respond this way? Why did she respond this way? Or Oh wow! What? How could we right. make them safer? Right. How, but, yeah, but exactly. That was not the what I was greeted with. What I was greeted with is that you're a lunatic. Keep your mouth shut. They're totally right. safe. Even though we're, it's totally safe and acceptable to talk about how aluminum and underarm deodorant is very deadly and can cause right. yeah. and can cause autism-like <laughs> right. symptoms, you know. Um, so, but we're not allowed but to talk about it, injecting not. it into muscle yeah, tissue. And, where it doesn't right. have a system to be cleansed in, and where, by the way, it does wow. cross the blood-brain barrier. A lot of people will say, you, you have a blood-brain barrier so that nothing can cross it. Well, how do you think they treat <laughs> mental illness? How do you think that they right. treat cancers in the brain? How do you think yeah. that, what do you think a diet pill does? Listen, I'm an actor. Right. I know what a diet pill does, okay? <laughs> it tells your brain you're not hungry because it goes to your brain. You know, like there, there are certain like simple questions that we really have to start asking yeah. ourselves, you know, but yeah. I think a big straw for me was, um, and I had just done another pilot right before COVID was introduced to society. I did another pilot for Disney that was a really wonderful pilot. It did not get picked up, but I was still, they were loyal to me. I was loyal to them, but you know, it came down to, choosing to keep my mouth shut and keep a career or choosing to save my kids because people right. need to know the truth. Once you start hearing your state governor say two weeks into this virus that the only way out is for every single person to be vaccinated and your children, you know, have a medical exemption yeah. and will die if they get another. They're saying, right. oh no, your kids are gonna have to get it. Listen, gloves yeah, are those, off. Yeah, gloves those are, are fighting words there. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. That, that's when the uh, mean mama comes out there. That's you know? right. That's, Mama right. bear. Heck That's yes. what I tell uh, people. I'm like, look, you cannot comply your way out of tyranny. So if you don't have the guts to stand up and fight for your cubs, get out of my way while I do it for you. Amen. There you go. Well, congrats. Congrats. Thank you for doing that. Number one. <laughs> and um, I know there's a lot of uh, pushback, you know, when you do that, especially someone that is uh, in a position that you're in and it's your livelihood, you know, and that's, yeah. that's, when people will actually step up and say, I'm going to do what I believe is right, even if it involves my livelihood, um, a lot of things can change by that. You know, if people just sit back on their laurels and think, well, somebody else will do that for me, or it's not as bad as what you think it is, then they're going to be surprised in about five years when things have changed so much that they don't even recognize not only yeah, who yeah. they are, but who and our country is. That's right. If we go to a global great reset, no one will recognize any of the freedoms that we have anymore. Oh, and yeah. so it's really, really crucial that we step up and protect our freedoms. And, and even the people who are very, you know, I was accused when I, I basically was canceled um, two years ago when, um, Joe Biden had tweeted, wear a mask with a picture of him with a mask. And honestly, I've been filming family camp. 
I was out in the middle of nowhere in Oklahoma, <laughs> in Oklahoma at this campsite where I'm telling you, you could not get cell reception to save your life. So I really didn't know that there was a mask debate going on. All I knew was that if I put one on, I can't breathe, so I'm not doing that. Right. right. So uh, I had no idea. So I simply responded to his tweet and said, um, that's not law. It is an overreaching suggestion, but you do you. And I start getting all of these ding, 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 ding on my phone. And I thought, what in the oh, world? Oh, my goodness. And all these people, you're so brave. Thanks for speaking up. I'm like, what did I do that is so brave? <laughs> Well, I did. And here's the thing. I didn't do something that was great. I, I stepped into a pile of doo-doo is what I did. I, yeah, I really exactly. Did. Yeah. You no, know? but then um, I stood by it because I'm yeah. not going to wear it. And because you can't comply your way out of this tyranny. So I was canceled and labeled a racist who thinks black lives don't matter, a bigot and anti and homophobic. All because of the mask. All because yeah, I it, said masks are not law. Mess, right. Right. I was Isn't like, that, crazy? that is a very strange and huge leap. Because I'm not saying they're yeah. not law for just white people. I'm saying they're not law for anybody. Anybody. Nobody yeah. has to wear that. Every person has the right to say if they want to breathe oxygen fully or not. That's every human's right. And if you don't recognize that as your human right, then you are selling our country out. It will be enslaved forever. Yes, you're exactly right. You give them an inch and they take them out. That's the problem. You know, yeah. Now, anytime, anytime somebody sneezes that looks different, it's gonna, it's gonna be an issue. But I, I do believe that they kind of pooped in their own nest due to the fact that it, you know, they, they did such harsh um, restrictions and uh, this thought process behind it that I think, you know, if there is a, if there ever is a pandemic, uh, a real pandemic, and I don't mean that it wasn't a pandemic. Everybody, I know people got sick, but I'm talking like Black Plague, you know, Spanish yeah. flu type pandemic kills you know, hundreds of millions of people, uh, it'll actually kill billions of people because nobody's going to comply because they didn't tell the truth uh, on this last one. And uh, there's so well, much I always, false I, This is one of the things <laughs> about information. It's so much false information. This is one of my things yeah. that I complained about, about the mask. Like I spoke at the Williamson County School Board meeting and that video went viral. So I was canceled mm -hmm. again. So apparently you can cancel someone twice. I don't know what happened. <laughs> I like woke up and I was still here and I was like, it's a miracle. I, I, <laughs> um, so, yeah, so I spoke at that and I said, even though I have vaccinated children, I would not put a mask on them. And this is how the media changed that my words. They said, Lee Allen Baker says that she refuses to protect her children from COVID. That's oh what they my said. Gosh. Here's my point Seriously. to parents. Like, think rationally. First of all, Nancy Pelosi didn't wear a mask in public places. Neither did her little nephew, little Gabby Gabby Newsom. He didn't wear right. one when he was having his big dinner. The reason they didn't, and people need to stop fighting over politics. That's not political. What you need to ask yourself is, why do they feel safe not wearing a mask? Why do they yeah. feel safe? They feel safe doing right. it. They have no problem doing it, right? At the end of the day, if it is a pandemic that is such that people are dying in the streets, are dying, how about this, in their home. I've never heard of one case where someone with COVID died in their home. They all died right. in hospital, but in okay. Hospital. Mm -hmm. So, um, but no one died in their home. Were that to be the case, are you really gonna send your kid to school with a little piece of cloth over their face and think that's yeah, gonna protect exactly. them? Right. No, you're gonna keep your kid home at that point. Well, yes, yeah, you're exactly right. You know, it's funny, I do, uh, I have a small construction company at, at, and I do ministry as well. and every now and then I'll do some drywall. And so I wear a, a mask, um, but when I get done drywalling, I literally have white thick marks going to my nostrils and up through my, you know, it's just like these things don't work. I know they don't work. They do, they do the best that you can. And uh, it, was, it was really weird, especially, you know, as a pastor, um, my church, when, when it first kicked in, you know, the whole world shut down. It was like, oh my gosh, okay. So I've never, I'm 53 years old. I've never been through a pandemic. I guess I, you know, kind of need to make sure that I don't take out half my church out with this stuff. So we shut down only for four weeks. You know, after that fourth week, I was like, the church will never survive. There's no reason yeah. for us not to do this. And so we got back together relatively quick. You know, again, we're in the Midwest in St. Louis and it wasn't near as restrictive as it was on the East Coast and the West Coast. 
And so we got back together and, um, I mean, you could just tell that even in that four weeks, it, it did a lot of damage, um, with, you know, just the psyche and just your, your stress and your anxiety being stuck in a house for four weeks. Um, you know, nobody went to work, uh, everybody got to stay at home and work from home. And uh, we were doing sermons, you know, I was doing sermons, just like if you and I were sitting here on a stupid phone, I about mm -hmm. poked my eyeballs out just trying to do it. And, you know, it, it at the end of it, it, we look back and it's just like, what was all of that for? And right. as a, as a follower of Jesus, like I, I truly believe the sovereignty of God and God's got your ticket. It doesn't matter if it's COVID, a, a bus or old age. I mean, you, he's got your ticket, he's got your number. And so we can't live in fear uh, over a, a virus that may or may not kill you. I mean, you, you don't have yeah, you don't have a you don't have a, a a promise of the next minute, much less you know worrying about the future like that. Um, we got so busy worrying about dying that we completely gave up living. Oh, that's good. good. Yeah, amen. You know? That's exactly that's really. Listen, good. every now and then I have a few little nuggets. Just telling you, I have <laughs> well, a little a jar one. of my nuggets that I'm like, I'm going to make a t-shirt out of that. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. It's almost like, uh, uh, I, I didn't listen to much country music, but Tim McGraw's song, uh, live like you were dying. Like yeah. that's like, kind of like, kind of like that. Exactly. So, so how did you fare through, um, the COVID? You said you were making a movie, right? So what happened was I was, right. I was cast in family camp and it was to be start shooting in April and then COVID hit and the lockdowns happened actually on my birthday, March 13th. I'll never forget it. That was my last day to step foot in Los wow. Angeles. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. And so you left March. So you're in Nashville now, correct? Yes. So okay. March 13th, uh, there's a girl, um, who had given me, she was a fan from Belgium. Charlotte is her name. And she had made me a birthday video every year since I was on good luck, Charlie. And she's really oh, good. Great. She's really talented. And one time they came to like a D 23 event and I went out to meet them and I met her mother and her grandmother and her father and the whole family. And she's so precious. And she got an internship working in video, uh, in Los Angeles. And I thought, you know what? I said, Charlotte, on this birthday of mine, I said, I want to give you an out. You have worked so hard to make me these amazing videos for my birthday. Right. This is this the last video that you're going to make for me for my birthday is going to be the two of us together going to lunch. I'm going to take you to lunch. So this was on March 13th, my last day in Los Angeles. So I spent it with my biggest fan, Charlotte. And it was so weird. We would go to this restaurant and they'd be closed. I remember walking by another restaurant and all their employees would be sitting around a table and they're all talking and listening everybody closed signs turning and I thought what wow. in the world so then I hear okay we're going to shut down for two weeks what well, for I'm a homebody so at first I was like Hee -hee, I'm gonna like yeah, decorate exactly. for Christmas <laughs> we're gonna have so much fun this is gonna be awesome <laughs> right and and then two weeks passes and we're it's it's extending this is the big kicker. In the meantime, I'm washing vegetables with spray and hydrogen peroxide spray. I'm, if any groceries yeah. are bought by my husband, they're in the garage and, and I make them stay there for like 24 hours. One time I got a package, I, I put a hair dryer in it to heat it, right? My wife did the exact thing. I was like so ticked. I was like, Walmart would drop off. You know, everybody starts delivering all of a sudden. And Walmart would drop off a box and she would walk out there with, fumigate and spray and put in the heat and all that. I was just yeah. like, oh my gosh, what do we and, come to? Yeah. And then they said, then the CDC says, because I'm like, listen, I tell my husband, like, you put gloves on, you go to the store, you touch something that someone else has touched. And then right. like oh, the, the touch, the cheese touch thing in my head starts started going like all over the place about touching this and touching <laughs> that and where it would go <laughs> and how germs really work. And then the <laughs> CDC comes out uh, like week two and a half and says, you can't get it by touching things. And I was like, you be lying to us. You be lying. You be lying. Uh, and and that's when I was like, yeah. I'm not getting it. So I started doing lots of research. Um, right. I started when Trump came out and said hydroxychloroquine. I immediately looked up um, a natural supplement, obviously, because I believe in supplements more. So, right. um, And I had found a study in the NIH that was done in 2015 that said that ECEG and green tea and quercetin, the bioflavonoid, acted the same as hydroxychloroquine. And what they did was mm. they became what's called a zinc ionophore. 
and they open the viral cell wall so that zinc can penetrate and stop viral replication. And that this was proven to be wow. a cure and SARS COV with ACE2 inhibitor. That's no kidding. Yeah. Wow. And so they 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 knew about a they knew about SARS COV2 in 2015. And B, there's a supplement that can stop it. And so I was right. like, hmm. I'm, not, wow. I'm just not buying any of it. I'm just not buying any of it. Yeah. So I think crazy. I lasted for, I think I lasted 50 days in lockdown. And then I said, uh, we're done. And I left. So you packed up, moved from LA to Nashville, just right in the middle of it. They, on May uh, 8th, I drove and found quarantine camps for kids up the street from my house. On May 9th, I got on a plane with my children and the good dog and left the bad dog with my husband. <laughs> <laughs> and we came to Nashville and we've not been back. No kidding. Is yeah, your husband my, back with you now? Oh yeah, yeah. Hey, yeah, poor okay, thing. Okay. He, had, he had to go back and forth for six months until that house sold and pack up the whole house. And in the meantime, you know, I literally heard God's voice so strongly saying, get out, like right then and there. That's awesome. And so when I left, my friend said, my mom's in Florida on vacation for two weeks in her condo. You can stay at her house. So I stayed there for two weeks. And then I drove through to Kentucky and stayed with my parents. And then they called me, the skit guy said, we're on. Oklahoma is the first state open. Let's go make a movie. And I was like, great. So I drove there. And then wow. I, was, I was put up in a house there with my kids for a whole month. Right? Wow. It's like one, I would take a step, God would put solid ground beneath my foot. That's how it worked. That is awesome. That is great. So now you're, you're in Nashville and um, the, the movie is coming out relatively soon. Actually, it's coming out tomorrow night. I shouldn't That's say right. relatively soon. It is yeah. coming out tomorrow night and it is called Family Camp. Tell us a little bit about that. So Family Camp, it was such a magical, amazing experience. I loved it so much. But Family Camp is a movie that really all families can relate to. And, and I want you to be assured your children will enjoy it, but don't be fooled in the fact that adults it isn't geared for adults because it is, it right. is, a, it is, there is something in it geared. When I say the whole family, I mean, there is a segment of this film that speaks right to the heart of mothers. There is a huge element in this film that speaks right to the heart of fathers and of men. Uh, um, awesome. And, and it speaks to Christians. It speaks to people who are not Christians. It, it, there is something in this that will affect everyone. And more importantly, really, not maybe more importantly, but more enjoyably, everybody that goes to it's going to laugh. It's really funny. So it's about a woman named Grace Ackerman. That's who I play. And she realizes that her family, she feels like, is losing their way. And it's just not the family that she had envisioned. And her husband is constantly on the phone working or on the golf course, wheeling and dealing. And the son is always into his little projects. And the daughter's a teenager. And she's complete. like, how did that happen that our kids become teenagers overnight? And they've got their head in their little <laughs> phone all the time. Don't even see their faces anymore. Right. And she, one day in church, he comes in late with his little clickety clackety golf shoes and sits down next to her. And right at that time, the preacher is talking about family camp. And he says, I know I'm late again. How do I make it up to you? And she says, we're going to that family camp. So that's Great. kind of how it starts. And then where it goes is really funny. That is great. So I, I told you before we started recording that uh, my family and I, this, that we're actually going in uh, August again. This will be our 18th year to go to family camp. It's a uh, it's called Life Action Family Camp in Buchanan, Michigan. It's just right across the border, Indiana and Michigan. And it's one of the most, it's the best place. Like our kids would rather go there than to Disney World. And uh, we, we have a, a great time. It's almost like, um, it's almost like a church camp, you know, but yeah. for, for families, you know. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's, it's really cool, really fun. Man, every time I go up there, God speaks to me. I could come back like uh, the very first year that we went, we were so nervous. We were brand new Christians. We had a babies, you know, a three year old or a, no, a, yeah, a three year old and a two year old. And we had no clue what we we're going to do with life and uh, just trying to figure it all out. And we went up there and um, this guy, this speaker, he was a homeschool guy and his wife was a homeschooler and they had seven kids. I and mean, they were just stair step, you know, just 
one right after another. And they were the sweetest, nicest, godly kids. And I thought, man, that's what I want for my family. And on the drive home, you know, we spent seven days there. And on the drive home, I looked over at my wife and I said, honey, we're supposed to homeschool. And she's like, ah, I know. And uh, so we homeschooled our first kids. And uh, we've got a 21. Who, my daughter's getting married this weekend and a 20 year old. And then I've got twin 11 year olds. And so um, uh, we take them every year and they just love it. So it's going to be, it's going to be I, awesome. I really want to go to one because they, I, I had so much fun filming about it. And yeah. honestly, when we filmed people are like, well, what'd you do with your kids? Well, uh, everybody brought their family with them. I mean, it truly was family camp for a while. Right. We went, like, I want to make a movie about how we made this movie. Uh, yeah, so that's great. Good. That's great. Well, I'll send you information on this one. This, yeah, they've please. been doing this for 25, 30 years. And I mean, we, we go up there and it's, it's all inclusive basically. And it's not, you know, they're nice places that you stay in and, and they have stuff for, you know, the family and then they have stuff for the couples and, uh, they, they take care of your kids, you know, and you have date night and uh, it's just, it's just really cool. And you eat a ton. There's, there's so much food there. It's, uh, <laughs> you, ha you have to start a diet before you get there because you're going to gain it when you, when you leave. And it's, <laughs> Listen, it's such, yeah. It is no joke. I have almost charcuteried myself to death out here in Tennessee because everyone wants you to come over for charcuterie. <laughs> and I literally stand over it going, I don't eat dairy as I'm eating cheese, right? right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah moving from LA back to uh you know the Tennessee area you're going to start uh the, the food is completely different so it is completely different I've had to put the brakes on and uh start exercising a lot more <laughs> right that's crazy well I I love what you said about the movie is that it really had a good place for men um and a great message for men because that's really what man of God's way is all about is to teach men how to number one love Jesus number two how to love their wives as Christ loved the church and then three how to be godly fathers and um, we see in our ministry especially uh, a lot of men who don't know how to be the man that the wife needs and they don't realize that they need a woman that or excuse me they, women need a man that is um, spiritually leading them uh, loving them praying with them and and making them um honoring them as one of God's children. Uh, too many men bypass the marriage to become relatively good fathers. Uh, but God gave marriage to us as one flesh. Like that is, we are meant to be together forever. And our kids, unfortunately, we're to raise them so they do leave. And um, too many men focus on their marriage or their, their kids and forget about their marriage. And the next thing you know, 18, 20 years later, uh, they're staring at their wife across the kitchen table and say, I don't even know you. Yeah. And, and we want we want men, especially uh, within the church, to know that they need to honor their wife. They need to protect their wife. They need to love their wife. They need to serve their wife. And then both of them can be really great parents at that in that in that moment. And um, uh, I hope that's kind of the message that it sounds like that's the message that family yes. camp will have. I think it, it tries to help give men the courage to lead. Yeah. Um, and the one of the things that I loved about playing Grace Ackerman and that I so identified with her is that, you know, she's she's the leader, right? Yeah. She she yeah. pulls in. So getting her to that breaking point of surrender, you know, I, I explained in an interview, I think it was the Christian Post, that like I've gone through life like this. Like yeah. I have fought every day to save my kids, to save my life, to work for my career. Everything has been hard. It has been work. And right. I learned through making this movie and going through that journey with that character. It was such by the grace of God that I played the character of grace because I've learned what it's like to go through life like this, mm, you know, you and, and to trust that That's someone good. loves my kids more than me and has got my back front side, top and bottom. And you know, there is, there, there is more to life than my struggle, right? I can right. turn it over to someone bigger than me. And as someone who's really felt the pressure to not only fight for my life, my career, my kids' lives now with this whole COVID thing, but now I'm out there speaking to kind of like fight for the world. Right. It's, it's really taken a weight that uh, had to break me. It, it's a weight that had to break me or I would not have mm -hmm. surrendered it, you know? Well, the, the Bible says that vengeance is mine and that's God speaking. And sometimes we just have to let go and let him do what he does best. And many times we get in the way of that. You know, we, we try to 
go before him instead of, you know, bringing him before us. Uh, we try to go out before him and we end up messing it up, whether it's, you know, a marriage or your family or your career or even, you know, what you're doing now as an advocate for, you know, the, the, uh, the freedoms that we have in the United States. Um, and I, I respect that. That's, that's awesome that you do that because too many people in your position would look at, um, you know, they, they would put their career before whether it's their morals or their belief system or even their soul sometimes. Uh, and I respect you for not, not doing that because you could easily um, just give all this up and, and do movies and make money and, and, you know, be extremely famous. Uh, not that you're not famous now, but I'm talking, you know, you know, uh, big headlining um, movies and stuff like that. But you have you have a, a standard of beliefs that keep you from doing that and that you won't let anybody knock you off that. And I, I really appreciate you doing that because we need more of that um, in the in the kingdom. Yes. And um, I appreciate you doing that. That's Thank awesome. you. Thank you. And I will say that God has been so good to me because I have learned when I stand my ground, he opens doors for me that I didn't even know could be opened. Yeah. I mean, you know, that is awesome. there's a joke in yeah. our movie that says when God opens the door, when God closes the door, he opens a Chick-fil-A. But I mean, he really does <laughs> open so many doors. <laughs> I love the skit guys. I've followed them for years and their, their, uh, their, their skits are all funny. Their, their videos, their, uh, they've got a lot of sermon bumper stuff that we, you know, pastors will use before sermons and stuff like that. And, uh, they've always done a really great job and their message is just, it's just, it's just poignant, man. It just hits a place that, um, you know, most of the people that are trying to do that stuff doesn't do. They've got a great yeah. gift. One they of are my so favorite, gifted. Yeah. One of my favorite is uh, mom goggles. I don't know if you've ever seen that. I've not seen uh, that one. Uh, you, yeah. You've got it. You got a YouTube and it's called mom goggles and it's, uh, you know, mom goes away for the weekend and uh, dad orders on Amazon because the kids are running around. They don't know what to do. And, um, you know, they don't think anything major has happened. And he orders mom goggles on Amazon and they come up to the door and he puts them on. He's all of a sudden he sees everything the way that the mom does and it freaks him out. It's a, it's a oh really good Oh my gosh, skin. I'll have to so watch yeah. that one. When, yeah, yeah. I, when I showed up to work, they were so gracious, you know, they would um, say things like, um, thank you so much for doing this to me. Thank you so much for sharing your talent with us. And then you know, the days would go on and the weeks would go on and I'd be giving notes to people and saying, don't you think the camera should be here? And I know the camera should be there. Listen, it saved you 20 minutes if you just caught here, went there and went there. And they would say to me, thank you for being so generous. And I was like, is that what you call it? That's so sweet. Yeah. Because most people are like, you're too bossy, stay in your lane, right? <laughs> and they called it, you know, sharing my gifts or being generous. They were so sweet. That's great. That is great. So the movie comes out tomorrow night, um, yes. and we we want to encourage everyone to go see this movie again. You know what we want from not only uh, Hollywood, but we also want from all media outlets um, better content, better godly content, better moral content, and uh, they can continue this if we support them and if yes. we. Hit the, the movie theaters. The movie theaters are open now. Hit the movie theaters. That's how they, they really see um, the payback and the benefit of doing these movies. And it'll be a huge support for uh, more and more movies. Yeah, I would say opening weekend is really, really important because that's yeah. what our industry looks at to see whether more of that type of movie can get made or not. It doesn't benefit me. I made my money the day that I showed up to work. So it right. But this would benefit the faith-based community of getting more godly movies in the theaters. I mean, if, if you want things that you can go with your family to see and you want to spread the word, then this is how you spread it. If you know, you may be a quieter person, you're not on the street opening your mouth like I am, but you can go see a movie and take your family to see it and sit down for right. two hours and laugh and enjoy yourselves, you know? Yes. Um, so it's time to really uh, support these types of movies. It's really crucial. That's great. Now, do you see yourself, what, like, what do you have in the future? You got anything major uh, happening? I did another movie in Tennessee, uh, but as you can imagine, being canceled kind of slows down the workload, right? right. Um, 
But, you know, I really hope that this movie does so well that we make more and more and more. I mean, it really does have the potential to be kind of like the vacation series of movies with Chevy Chase oh, that's for, great. For, for a Christian community, you know. Right. So I really, you know, I have big hopes tied to this movie, um, but it's in God's hands and, you know, that will be done. So we'll see. Amen. Amen. Well, it has been a pleasure and an honor to have you on here today and we will uh, help you promote this movie as much as possible. And uh, Lee Allen, I thank you so much for all that you're doing. And it's just a, a pleasure just hooking up with you again thank after you. many, many moons and years ago and uh, uh, just being in high school together. Um, I, I actually, I love your brother with all my heart. Uh, he and I talk all the time. Uh, I love what his, his heart for for God is, and uh, what a great steward of uh, the business that he has taken. That blows me away what he's done with uh, with your dad's, you know, little gas station and a couple storage wells. <laughs> he's taken yeah. it to where it is now. So uh, honored to know you and your family, and uh, we appreciate all that you do. Keep doing it, and keep uh, don't let them get you down. Thank you. And, uh, you, you keep fighting the fight. And Thank we appreciate you. you. All yes, right. Sure Leon, God, God bless. And we will talk to you soon. God bless. All right. Bye-bye.